The title for this morning's lesson is called Gotcha, or Life in the Church. And I'm going to read a little bit, and those of you who've read this week's article in Facebook or the newspaper that's coming out next week, when it does come out, you can read it then. But I want to read this paragraph to kind of introduce this lesson. You're right. There is no such word as gotcha, but it is found in the informal <coughs> Dictionary of American Language, and it says, I have got you, used to express satisfaction at having captured or defeated someone or uncovered their faults. As kids, this is the word we shouted when we hit someone with the seed spears of the spear grass plant. And that's what you're looking at there. Uh, you may notice if you have eyes and you're up close enough, there's a little tiny barb at the very pointed end of it. And if you threw them hard enough, they would stick in a person's skin barely and then would shortly fall out. But if they got in your clothes, you could laundry their clothes and they would still be in there and you would still get stuck even after your clothes had been washed. But one or two of these would not be enough. We'd like to get about six or eight of them between the thumb and forefinger. And then when someone wasn't looking, or even if they were, throw them at them. There's a young man older than me by the name of Bobby Saunders who lives in Canepa who responded to my article and he said this was not just a boy thing this is a boy and girl thing at Canepa we all threw these little spear things uh, I had one fellow who came on who said it's called an Indian spear uh, and the internet is called Texas spear grass and I haven't seen it around here but if I had, I'm sure the kids would be using it in the same way that we did back then. And that is to spread it by throwing it one another. But anyway, when we did this, we would throw it at them and then we would yell, gotcha. And of course, we could expect very soon that someone would gather up a few of these and throw them back at us and holler pretty much the same thing, except they would say, gotcha back. <laughs> and so when we talk about Bible subjects and Bible topics, our goal is not a gotcha. It's not, I grew up with the expression, nailing somebody's hide to the wall. And those who are young probably need an older person to explain to you what that means. But it had reference to the old trapping process of trapping animals, skinning the animals, then nailing their hide to the wall so it could dry and then be taken down and sold at the trading post. And that's a term that people like to use when they out-argued someone. I don't like to use that term. I like, I like to discuss Bible in such a way that the objective is more of a, a wow, I got it, rather than for me to be able to say, gotcha, because there's really no spiritual value in doing things that way. And so the lesson that I wrote for the article is basically what I'm going to share with you this morning. In fact, some of you, if you're familiar with sign language, will recognize this sign. Do you recognize it? It basically means, I got it, I understand, I see the point. And so this is more of what I'm after in today's lesson than the other. I understand. Uh, have you ever heard the phrase, the church doesn't save anyone, Jesus does? I've heard that all my life. And what this saying effectively does is removes the church from the salvation process. It's not a part of salvation. You can be saved and never be a member of any church anywhere because it's a personal thing between you and God. And that's what this sentence actually winds up meaning. And as a result, 
Many believe that salvation is separate and apart from the church. In fact, many people I study with, I say, when were you saved? They were saved, well, I was saved in a revival. Well, what happened? Well, the preacher asked all of us to come down to the front, and we accepted Jesus as our Savior. And I was saved. Well, when did you become a member of the church? Some of them will say, well, uh, that night, a week later, a month later, and some of them will say, well, I, I guess I never did, because I really didn't feel the need to. And so the church has been relegated to a position of unimportance. And as a result, thousands today believe that I can be a saved person and not have to be a church person. Let me give you a little bit of definition here because I don't want you to misunderstand what I'm, what I'm meaning when I say a church person. Uh, I'm using it in the terminology that I hear from others. When I use the word church person in today's lesson, I'm talking about a Christian that is as active as they can be as a member and a servant in the church Jesus built. That's what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about a person who says, yeah, I think churches are okay. I'm talking about someone who is committed to live holy in the spiritual body of Jesus Christ. Now, let me give you another definition. Because sometimes I hear this. I'm not a church person. But I read my Bible and I pray. And so what they are telling me is they believe that they have a specific line of salvation from them to Jesus separate or apart from any kind of activity in any kind of church. And so many of them will call this institutionalized Christianity. And in my background, to be institutionalized was not a good thing necessarily. It was a bad thing. And so when people use the term institutionalized church, they're talking about a church that has some kind of organization. And just to be totally honest with you, the church Jesus built does have organization. Amen. Specific organization. No doubt about it. So as I go through this study, you're going to hear me first tell you what the church has to offer a church person. A person who is in the body of Christ, active as circumstances allow, and are supportive of that church and understand what it is. So what does God's Word say? I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build. Here's the first thing. My church. So if you're a church person, using my definition, an active Christian in his church, if you're a church person, then you realize you're in a church that belongs to Jesus, and that's not all. And the gates of Hades, death, will not overpower it. You are in a sheltered position. But... What if, uh, what if I'm not a church person? What am I saying about this verse if I'm not a church person? I'm saying I'm not a part of the church Jesus said He would build. And that's not all. I'm saying that I'm not sheltered from Hades or death. That is my enemy. But as a Christian in His church, you are sheltered from the significance of death when it comes to spiritual death and life. Let's look at another verse. Let's look at Colossians 1 and verse 24. Now here's what you're looking for. If you are a church person, faithful and active in the Lord's church, as you can be, then look at what you have. Now I rejoice in my suffering for your sake and in my flesh I do my share on behalf of His body, which is the church, in filling up what is lacking in Christ's suffering. So what is the church? It is the spiritual body of Christ. As a church person, you are in the spiritual body of Christ. 
Let me add a side note here. This is important. The people who believe they're saved outside the church believe in two churches and two bodies. Ephesians chapter 4, beginning with verse 4 and following, states plainly there is, hold up your fingers if you know how many it says, there is one body, not two, one. And the people who believe you're saved outside of the church believed in two baptisms. How many baptisms are there according to God through Paul in Ephesians? Hold up the fingers if you know. There is one baptism. The two baptisms come from the idea that when I accept Jesus as my personal Savior, I am baptized by the Spirit. There's one baptism. And if I want to be in some church, then I can be baptized in water that's baptism number two. If this is the one baptism, this is sinful because it violates the truth of one baptism. And it's not part A and part B. Jesus didn't say there's one baptism, part A and part B. There's one body, part A and part B. There's one God, part A and part B. There's one Jesus, part A and part B. There's one. And so that's what we're looking at. I'm glad you can't see everything that pops up on this screen. I don't like pop-ups. Y'all have her deal with those. <laughs> now, just suppose, though, that I am not a church person. What does this mean to me when I look at this verse? It means I'm not a part of the spiritual body of Jesus. I'm claiming salvation outside of Jesus' spiritual body. That's what I'm claiming. That, well, let me make another thought here. And that there's no need for me to suffer for the church because I'm not a part of it. And I don't have to be a part of it. So there's no use suffering for the church as Paul talks about his doing and their doing. Let's look at another verse. I had to pare down these verses. There's just so many. Let's look at Acts 20 and verse 28. Paul's writing to the elders of the church in Ephesus. He says, Be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. If you are a church person and in the church Jesus built, you and I have been bought and paid for by the blood of Christ. The blood of Christ bought and paid for the church. Thank God. And that's not all. There are those in the church who have some responsibility in leading the church. When a church is fully developed, it will have elders and deacons as well as evangelists, teachers, and members who do a variety of things so that the whole body works together. Oh, but if I'm saved outside the body, I'm not a part of that working body, am I? I'm on my own. So what if I'm not a, a church person? What does this verse say to me? Well, the first thing it says to me is I'm not a part of of having been bought by his blood because I'm not in his body folks where does your blood flow where does it flow it flows in your body no wonder the blood of Jesus continues to cleanse us of our sin his blood flows in his body it doesn't flow outside of his body it flows in his body so I'm not a part of the blood-bought church. And further, I am not under those who shepherd the church of God. I don't have any leaders telling me what I need to do or what I need not to do. I'm making those decisions on my own. Let's take a look at another verse. This time Ephesians 5 and 23. For the husband is the head of the wife. We've got that. As here it is. Christ is also head of the church. He himself being 
the Savior of the body. If you're in His spiritual body, what does this verse tell you you have the hope of? Salvation. And if you're in His body, who does it tell you is your head? Jesus Christ Himself. These are the blessings that belong to those who are in His body. But if I'm not a church person, then I believe that I'm saved outside of His body, outside of where His blood flows, outside of those that He is the Savior of. It's amazing to me how somebody will say, the church has nothing to do with salvation. It's just me and Jesus. No, it's not. It's Jesus and His body and me in it. That's the relationship I need to have with Jesus Christ. Here's another thought. I have no desire to serve in the church which He saves. And I'm not going to. I'm not going to vacuum the floors. I'm not going to knock doors. I'm not going to pray for my brothers and sisters. I'm not going to be here on Sunday to encourage you. And I'm not going to be here so you can encourage me. You are just not a part of my life. I am not a church person. Let's look at another verse and see the implications there. Romans 12 and verse 5. So we who are many are one body in Christ and individually members one of another. What do you see there? You see a connection between church members with each other in the one body. I didn't even think about that until I did this, but I noticed my head got this hand to cooperate with this hand and did this. Now, if this hand will not cooperate with this hand, doctors think I have a problem. And I do. And sometimes that can happen. Sometimes paralysis comes along where all this hand does is hang there. And it won't cooperate with this hand. But in the body of Christ, He wants our hands our fingers, our ears, our nose, our eyes to work together in His body. But if I'm not a church person, I am not members with others in the body of Christ. I don't work with others. I do my own things. I'm not even connected to His body but I'm claiming to be saved outside of the flow of His blood, outside His headship, my head. It has its difficulties in controlling this body all the time because parts of my head want to do one thing and sometimes parts of it wants to do something else. But my head doesn't control your body. Have you ever just for the fun of it, sit there and stared at someone in hopes that you could make them do something? Or am I the only one that's ever pulled that off as a kid? Just stare at the back of somebody's head and you're just trying to make them feel uncomfortable, <laughs> but it doesn't work. It doesn't work. We don't have the power to move somebody else's body. If it's not in our body, our brain isn't going to make it work. So why are does Jesus the head control? It's His body, the church. Aren't these passages imposing and impressive as to the blessings we have in Christ Jesus? But here's another thought. It goes along with this one. I have no desire to encourage any of you in the body if I'm saved out of the body and I'm not a part of it. That's not my job. Hebrews 10 verse 25 talks about encouraging one another so much the more as we see the day approaching. 
I have a job to encourage my brothers and sisters, my fellow members of the body, just as my fellow members of the body have a responsibility to encourage me. That's part of the body. The way my body does it is, if my back itches, I want my hand to scratch it. Is that normal? If my finger hurts, the rest of my body wants to protect it and keep it from hurting more. If I taste homemade ice cream, my whole body seems to rejoice. Are you understanding the idea of the church is the spiritual body of Jesus Christ? But if I'm not in His church, I don't have all of that. Let's look at another one, Ephesians 3 and verse 10. So that the manifold wisdom of God might be made known through the church to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. So how, who is supposed to spread the news of the wisdom of God? According to Scripture. Who's supposed to be doing that? His church. His body. And that is an honor for us to do. The God we worship is a great and awesome God. He is a God who will be there any time we call on His name. He is a God who knows everything that's going on in our life. And going back to our Bible class lesson, when John records that Peter said, I'm going to die for you, and Jesus says, you're going to deny me three times before the rooster crows. Peter, you're going to fall flat on your face. Loose interpretation. And the very next thing he said to him was, let not your heart be troubled. Don't give up, Peter. Don't give up. And Peter spent the rest of his years proclaiming the wisdom of God through the church. But, if I'm not a church person, I'm not a part of God's manifold wisdom. I'm outside of it. If I'm not a church person, I have no need to make His wisdom known through the church. Think about these things. I'm not interested in a gotcha moment with anybody who reads what I've written or is listening to this sermon. I am not interested in a gotcha moment. I'm interested in a I've got it moment. I've got what the church is. I understand it is the body of Christ. I understand His blood flows in His body, not out of His body. I understand He is the head of His body. And if I'm not in His body, He's really not my head. We need to get it and be grateful for it. Look at Hebrews 10, 25. Not forsaking our own assembling together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day drawing near. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. Christians are faithful in attendance. Christians are faithful in attendance. I know there are things that will hinder attendance from time to time. I know that proverbially, proverbially, our ox falls in the ditch. In other words, sometimes people have to work when worship services are going on. I understand that. I know that sometimes people are sick and can't make it. I know sometimes we get older and our body doesn't cooperate with our mind and our mind wants to be in worship, and how many times I've heard that, I do not know. I can't, I can't even imagine the number. How many times I've had people tell me, you have no idea how much I want to be there. But their body says, no, you can't. I just want these folks to say, God, listen to me, God 
understands. Did you hear me? God understands. Quit feeling guilty about what you can't do. Thank God you can do whatever it is that you can. That's not in my notes either, but it's appropriate for the lesson. But suppose I'm not a church person. Then how does this verse deal with me? Well, one of the first things it is, I'm not going to be involved in assembling together. I'm not going to be here. I don't have any reason to be here. I don't have any reason to sing praises with you. I don't have any reason to pray with you. I don't have any reason to give money to support the cause of which you're a part. I don't have any reason to partake of the Lord's Supper. I don't have any reason to be in Bible class with you. I have no reason to assemble with you. Because I'm not a part of you. I'm not a church person. The implications are tremendous of getting to be in the body of Christ. But the implications are also tremendous if I'm not in His body where His blood flows. Another? I am professing no need to encourage or be encouraged. I'm not going to encourage you as a church person. I'm not a church person. In fact, if you come and start talking to me, I may tell you, leave me alone. But in the body of Christ, we attend regularly. We encourage one another. And that is a significant part of our purpose in assembling together is the encouragement we give each other. Some people say the only reason to attend worship is to partake of the Lord's Supper. They have missed the point of the Lord's Supper. Because the bread speaks of His body, the church. And we're here to encourage one another and to support one another and do our best to help each other get to heaven because of the tremendous love God has poured out on us and the tremendous love we get to share with each other. The body of Christ is His church. Amen. Let's look at another verse. This time, Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 17. Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with grief, for this would be unprofitable for you. God, God said, I want the church organized in such a way that the mature are leading the immature to become mature, that they may lead the immature to be on and on for generation after generation. Specifically, he identifies elders and deacons and evangelists. At first, there also were apostles and prophets, according to Ephesians chapter 4. Those miraculous aspects no longer exist. We no longer have prophets. We have the complete Word of God in the New Covenant. But I'm not a church person, someone may say. And as a result, I have no leaders to obey and no leaders to submit to. And I don't want any leaders to obey and submit to. I don't want anybody else to assume they are going to give account for the way they have encouraged or corrected me. Leave me alone. But look what God wants you to have in the body of Christ. 
He wants you to have people who are mature, who care, who will risk the role of leadership and the criticism that comes with it. For years, my wife and I trained men and their wives to move into roles of leadership in the church, the men toward the role of elders and deacons. And I had a saying that I repeated to them thousands of times. You've got to love the church more than you hate criticism or you'll never make it as a leader in the church. You've got to love the Lord more than you hate criticism or you'll never be a leader in the church. And any Christian man or woman who takes some kind of leadership role, even if it's teaching a class of toddlers, you're opening yourself up to criticism. And a lot of people think the best way to avoid criticism is to act like the church is a graveyard and nobody do anything. The church is not a graveyard. It is a hospital caring for each of us as wounded by sin, working with the healing blood of Christ. I don't want anyone watching over my soul. Let's look at another verse. 1 Timothy 3 and 15. In case I'm delayed, I write so that you will know how one ought to conduct himself in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and support of the truth. Look at what you have in the church. Look what you're called. You are called the household, the family of God. Christians, we are blood family. The blood that flows in our spiritual veins is the blood of Christ. We are forever family. Kay and I raise children. Those children share our blood, but only for this earth. Only for this earth. But the blood Kay and I share in Christ is forever blood. Forever family. No wonder Jesus wants us to love and care for and pray for and correct when necessary each other so that we can together as individuals collectively go to heaven. But what if I'm not a church person? What does this verse tell me? It tells me I'm not a part of the household of God. I'm not one of his family members. And that's not all. It tells me that I don't have any particular way I'm to conduct myself because I'm not a part of the family. As long as you're part of this family, this is what you're going to do. You ever hear that? It may be a different expression, as long as you're under my roof. But it's the same aspect. Now in our family, we don't do that. In our family, we do this. And that's what he's talking about. Christians in the family of God, there are some things we're not supposed to do and there are some things we are supposed to do. But if I'm not in the family, I don't have to worry about that. I get to choose what I do and what I don't do. Let's look at another verse. And yes, I will run out of these shortly. Hebrews chapter... But I had to quit right look I had to quit looking for verses like this. There's too many. Hebrews 12, 23. To the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven and to God the judge of all. And here it is. To the spirits of the righteous made perfect. Who's he talking about? Who does he say he's talking about? He says... I'm talking to the church. That's who I'm talking to. 
It is good to have your name on the roll of this congregation or some other of the Lord's church. But the role you want it on is in heaven. And that is where church people, according to the definition I've given you, that's where their name is written. In the book of life. And that's not all. What else does this verse say? Look at that. The spirits of the righteous made perfect. How? By the blood of Christ. Where is that? In His body. Where the blood flows. That's where it is. But someone may say, I'm not a church person. What does that mean? If I'm really not a church person, my name isn't written down in heaven in the book of life. And that's not all. My spirit isn't being made perfect either. I told you I'd reach the end of those verses. But I want to pick key words out of each one of those verses. It's His church. It's His spiritual body. It's His blood that flows through it. He is the Savior of it. We are to care one for another. We proclaim the wisdom of God through the church. We assemble together. We have leaders that we submit to and obey in accordance with the will of God. I do know there are false teachers. I'm not talking about that. We are the household, the family of God. Our names are enrolled in heaven. And if I'm not a church person, should I be one? Should I make it my business to be a church person? Someone who is in the body of Christ? Who has decided to let Him be the head over my life rather than myself and take on the responsibility of being an active, functioning part of the body. You've seen this, haven't you? Here's the church. Here's the steeple. Open the doors. And there are the members. What a silly illustration that makes such an awesome point. And the blood that flows through the body continually forgives us our sins. And when we do sin, that same chapter, 1 John chapter 1, verses 5 through verse 10, tells us, you will sin, period. If you say you don't sin, you make God a liar and His truth is not in you. But if you do sin, you repent and His blood keeps on forgiving you of your sin. You don't want to get out of where the blood is. You can. You can. That's another sermon, not for today. But you want to be where the blood is. And when a person says, I'm not a church person, they really don't understand what they're saying. They need to get in the book and see what the church is and the significance of the church and all that is involved in it. I would hope that all of us get a wow, I get it moment when we realize what the church is. When we rethink it and we remember it. <coughs> wow. I get to be in His body. I get to have His spiritual blood in my life. I get to be one of the members of the rest of His body. I get to be saved by Him. I get to be called His bride as part of His body. I get to have Him as my head, my mediator, my intercessor, my Lord, 
and my king in his body. How? You're all sons of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For, here's how it happens. All of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. And what does that look like? Faith in Jesus who died, was buried, and raised. And when I share in that sacrifice, His sacrifice, by dying to sins, by being buried in water, then I am raised to walk a life in the body of Christ, the church He built. I'm not after a gotcha moment. I learned a long time ago that when a preacher steps on somebody's toes, all they do is say, ouch, and move their foot and get mad at you. But if, like Peter, on the day of Pentecost, his words will prick the heart, that's where I aim. I aim at your heart. And if I don't hit your heart, I have missed your target, but maybe God's Word got there anyway.